Copper, the red metal that electrifies our world, is poised for a bullish run. In last week's video, we profiled our bullish long-term copper outlook. Here's a recap. EV soaring demand places copper at the forefront, crucial for motors, batteries, and charging infrastructure. Global economic recovery boosts industrial activity and infrastructure spending, supporting this copper demand. Supply constraints due to labor strikes, declining ore grades, and limited mining investments have tightened the copper market potentially driving prices above the current $4 per pound. Additionally, the green energy revolution increases copper demand for wind and solar installations. Urbanization in developing nations, mostly Asia, intensifies copper consumption in infrastructure projects. As these countries modernize, copper's importance grows. Despite EV expansion, global economic recovery, supply challenges, green energy, rapid urbanization, there are some near-term bearish factors to warrant consideration. The rust. The big challenge we see with copper demand in the short term is the potential of an economic downturn. China has a whole host of problems, as does Europe and North America. The projections are rosy, but the current economic environment has signs of weakness and will require significant government stimulus across the globe to avoid a hard landing. Copper supply, swap line check. Now with all this demand potential, can the market actually get enough supply? We've written about it many times and how there's no shortage of copper in the world, but it won't get it for $3 a pound. That statement remains true today. Higher copper prices are required to incentivize exploration and development. The next chart shows global copper production separated by positive swap and negative swap line nations. Swap lines refer to agreements between US Federal Reserve and foreign central banks. In times of crisis, the Fed can deliver US dollars to those central banks. Only a small handful of nations around the world have access to these elusive swap lines. Breaking the copper producing regions into places that have access to swap lines can provide clues into the stability of a nation. As you can see, most of the world's copper comes from negative swap line nations in red. Chile and Peru are the world's largest producers of copper and they are not positive swap line nations. In addition, there are numerous political and social issues within those two key countries now and in the past. It is likely that royalty rates and mining taxes are going to go up to appease socialist views in those countries, especially with the political force and view of making the foreign companies pay their fair share for water and environmental protection. Don't forget an increased standard of living for the workers and social welfare of the community. Naturally, this is negative for the producer who sees its profit margins dwindle as foreign government rakes increase. The growth factor. Growth in copper supply is much the same as the current production environment. It's primarily fueled by negative swap line nations, namely Argentina, Peru, and Chile. However, there's also considerable growth in high risk negative swap line nations like China, Russia, Congo, Zambia, Papua New Guinea, and Argentina, and even Panama, which we discuss further in this piece. The next chart shows the cumulative new supply which should come online over the coming decade. This considers expansion projects as well as development stage assets worldwide. Forecasting the global copper supply. Now let's layer all this into a long-term global supply projection. This chart shows current supply broken down into global recycling, positive and negative swap line nation, current production and future production. You can see the most future copper production is not going to come from positive swap line nations. Tying it all together. Next, I'm going to show you a chart which shows the copper demand and supply projections under high, low and base case scenarios. These demand projections are plotted against the supply curve derived above. As you can see, under normal environments, we'll likely have enough copper throughout the decade. Though in later years, it is possible that a meaningful deficit arises. What's very difficult to model is the real world problems that can and will arise in the short term, like local disruptions and ongoing social challenges, higher costs of capital for exploration, development and production, higher operational costs, longer permitting times, increased government involvement. Some or all these factors will lead to supply restrictions and have the ability to shift the copper supply curve considerably lower. What does it mean? means that supply is likely to remain tight and that will lead to the world getting more copper, but not for $3 a pound. Subscribe to the KRO, which is a Katusa Resource Opportunities.
to find out exactly what prices I'm buying at and what price I sell at before the trade occurs. And you get to sell before I do. If you want to give your portfolio an edge, consider becoming a member and giving it a try for yourself. 